Three years ago, Defenders of Wildlife put out a white paper about the Section 40 rules, the peril and the promise. These rules should help conserve species and improve the effectiveness of the act, if properly implemented. Rules can authorize activities with minor or even beneficial effects on species recovery without the need for agencies to expend resources reviewing and issuing permits for these activities that they would otherwise have to do. These rules would exempt a wide range of activities from the prohibitions that apply to endangered species. Many appear designed to reduce or threaten species, the ESA's restrictions on land use, fishing, wildlife trade, and other human activities. More than half of the species currently listed as threatened have these special rewards. More than three-fourths of the mammals, three-fourths of the fishes, more than half the reptiles have these special rules. These rules can improve support for the ESA among the regulated community and their congressional representatives. The rules, however, are not without risk to conservation because they can impede species recovery if they lack proper safeguards, especially if they cover high impact land uses. And there will be a filing on the new rule to reject economic considerations. Well, 2006, National Wildlife Federation spokesman said, ESA explicitly requires balancing species protection and people's economic needs. So to repeat, In 1973, Congress was explicit that economic considerations should not affect species listing decisions. They should be made solely on the basis of the best scientific and commercial data available. However, economic analysis is part of critical habitat designation and recovery efforts. In critical habitat designation, the Secretary may take into consideration economic impact. On the recovery plan, it requires cost estimates and it requires a priority for development and implementation to species that would benefit the most and plans that conflict with economic activity. Those would be prioritized. Okay, now some politicians want to take science out of the Endangered Species Act and if that happens, it doesn't make any sense at all. But I'm left with it, but want to take science out. So, let's get some professorial commentary on that. Um, Madam Professor says, the ESA listing decisions must be based on science. Uh, uh, Mr. Professor says, economics has a role in the ESA, but not in listing. Uh, in a recent uh, article in the Review of Environmental Economics and Policy, three key lessons emerged from the economic literature about the ESA. Number one, Endangered species risks are just as much an economic problem as a biological problem, and thus economic parameters matter for ESA risk assessment. Number two, given scarce resources, the opportunity costs of implementation decisions in terms of reduced resources for other worthwhile causes must be taken into account. And third, economic incentives matter because they shape human behavior and thus are crucial for the recovery of the species. <clears throat> May 2019, as the world scientists raise extinction alarms, Trump guts the ESA. An article from the website Mashable, the Trump administration can't gut the ESA. On, uh, on August 12th, the Trump administration finalized changes in how uh, the government can enforce the ESA. Legal experts largely agree these new rules seek to weaken the act. Mashable, let's do a little media bias check on them. They are left -wise. It's understandable that conservation organizations in the media are hostile to the rule changes. The administration does not have the power to gut the ESA. Professor DeRamos at Berkeley 
since the media coverage has been overhyped, regulatory changes can never change the underlying statute. Professor Adler, Case, Case Reserve Western University. There's an exaggeration of potentially negative effects on conservation. Anytime anyone proposes doing anything with the ESA, some people tend to go ballistic. The administration is now better positioned to underprotect wildlife by allowing federal regulators to only assess adverse changes to habitat in the vaguely described foreseeable future. This could ignore the longer term predicted effects of accelerating climate change. Professor Duramus said the change gives the FWS more flexibility to determine when in the foreseeable future a species needs protection. She said this change may withstand legal challenge. New rules potentially uh, allow the government to assess potentially costly economic consequences of species protection, but these administration changes cannot diminish a core element of the ESA, which is a particularly powerful statute. Professor Huberts of Washington University said, although the FWS may now consider the economic impacts of protecting a species, this is dubious information. I was trained as an economist. I would agree with that. Um, Doremus said the economic impacts changes don't quite live up to the hype. I don't think it's an important change. The statute says they have to make determinations based solely on science. Hubert's added that scientific data, only scientific data, can be used to determine if a species needs protection. Doremus said if the administration argues that a species no longer needs protection, Based on economic impacts, that will be reversed by the court in five minutes. Adler thinks the rule changes may survive court challenges. Most of the changes are readily defensible legally. Doremus says the administration's intention is clear. They're trying to make it easier to underprotect species. We're up for discussion. I want to give you 15 minutes, but I want to put in, I want to close with something to get you thinking. Rabbi Daniel Schwartz from the Coalition on Environment and Jewish Life wrote, ESA acts like a modern day Noah's Ark, protecting the last remaining animals and plants in the places they live <coughs> from total annihilation. Under the guise of modernizing the ESA, the administration intends to drill holes in the ark with changes to the way the act is carried out. Noah's Ark, as we all know, is built at God's command to save the world's animals, as well as Noah and his family. The best book I've read about the Endangered Species Act is this one, 1995, called Noah's Choice. It might be all right in theory for the law to have a balancing act. But in practice, the drafters of the ESA believe endangered species always lost. Their solution was to have no balancing mechanism at all, a NOAA principle of law. Endangered species desk quote from the law firm. The NOAA principle is an environmental ethic. It suggests that all species have a right to exist, and humans have a moral responsibility for each and every one. Well, this is impractical. There's not enough money to save every species and implement every recovery. So what do we do? Put it out for discussion. More questions? Jay, can you um, talk about some of the changes that were made to the ESA, I believe, in 1988? Yeah. Um, just briefly, what was done and why? Well, the, the only change I can think of, Brad, that's a good, that's a good question. That's the last time the statute was changed. Yeah. The, the authorization for funding for the statute is to be renewed every five years. That was the last time that funding was authorized for the ESA. So it's gone through this continual resolution process, annual resolution process every year since. So there, there's no rational discussion of what the ESA budget ought to be. It is a line item within the 
agents of the Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fisheries Service, but they're not the only agencies that spend for species conservation. The, uh, the agencies that run these dams on the rivers in the West spend a lot of money trying to keep those salmon and that's not in the Fish and Wildlife Service or NIMS. Um, so that, that's the only thing that I know of for sure happened in 1980. I don't think there were any really substantive changes in the way the Act was originally written by Congress. As each one of us look at endangered species, uh, each one of us has a different idea on what plants, what animals, and what not we can do without. But the classic example, and maybe you'd review it because I forget the specifics, but was in California many years ago when the state of California was planning on something major going on, whether well, it was a new dam, but the whole process was stopped because of the existence of something called the snail darter. I had never heard of the snail darter. I, individually, I had to wonder, is this, whatever it is, worth it? Um, yeah, the, the California has, I think, uh, close to a thousand threatened and endangered species compared to our 20 in Idaho. And I, <coughs> I may be way off on that figure, but I know it's hundreds. Um, the snail darter is, is not an inhabitant of California. It was, it, 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 it's an inhabitant of the, of the uh, uh, Appalachia, in the Appalachian Mountains. So in, in, in the 1970s, a group of folks got together and they said, uh, you know, they're, they're building a dam over there that's going to fill, that's going to turn our favorite trout stream into a reservoir. It's also going to wipe out a community with 3,000 people in it. So let's see if we can stop that dam. And let's use this new species of fish that was just discovered in this river called the snail darter. The darters are little guys. They're about three inches long. I'm a fisherman, so I love to tell fish stories. This, this is a good one. Uh, thanks for asking the question. The little snail darter, it, it has cousins that look almost exactly like it, except they may have a different number of rays on their anal fin or a spotting that's a little bit different. There's about three dozen little darters that are all so the snail darter, guess what it eats? It eats those little snails like we have listed as endangered species now in Idaho. Um, that's what it eats. Um, so they, they, they sued uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, or they sued the Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, and and uh, uh, that case went all the way to the Supreme Court. This was in 1978. The act was passed in 1973, you recall. Um, it was the first of several cases that have gone to the Supreme Court. I can talk about others if you like. Uh, but the snail dart is a particularly interesting one because the Attorney General of the United States, I forget who was president then, uh, it was right after Carter. Carter. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So Carter's Attorney General, he came before the Supreme Court. He had a little preserved snail dart jar. He said, We've already spent $100 million on this project. We're going to stop it now because of this thing. <laughs> and one, one of the justices really railed on him and said, hey, this is the law. It's clear that Congress intended that these species be protected no matter what the cost. And that's in, that, that's almost a direct pair, uh, quote from, from the, the proceedings of case. So, okay, the Supreme Court said, no, you've got to protect that species. And if that means stopping the dam, stop the dam. Well, that, uh, the, the, the federal government didn't like that, so they, they wrote something in the Endangered Species Act in 1978 called the Endangered Species Committee, and which quickly became called the God Committee. <laughs> These are cabinet level guys. Uh, seven people, and I forget exactly who they are, but they get together, and if they think, it, it, their petition to meet, and if they think that this case, 
that, that was brought before them um, as a committee uh, is worthy of national or regional interest that outweighs the protection of that species, they can decide on behalf of the species. So they put together the God Squad, snail bear case came before me. The God Squad said, nope, got to stop it now. <laughs> so <laughs> that sort of backfired. So um, some, uh, I think it was Senator Howard Baker from Tennessee led the charge to get President Carter to sign a bill that went through both houses of Congress that authorized this dam despite the presence of snail bearers. So they completed the dam and they you know, sent some electricity out to these little villages out there. One of them they had to move 3,000 people. Um, they found snail darters in other streams in the vicinity. At the time it was listed, it was endangered species. Uh, a few years later, it was downlisted from endangered status to threatened status, and now it's off the list. It's recovered. So that, that's a success story. Thank you for asking the question. California, we can talk about gnat catchers, we can talk about coat jelly valley lizards, all kinds of other interesting creatures. We can talk about a butterfly that stopped the hospital project, other things like that. There, most of these are, are, are in that book that I referred to, Noah's Choice. Uh, excellent examples in there. Really well researched. Okay, so 17 states have snail bears. Yeah. Or in the process of suing. Uh, suing. And they've already filed the suit. Agencies yep. are suing. Yep. Um, so, can those changes that the Trump administration has installed can can they go forward with those changes, or do those changes are are those changes on hold until the suits are? Good are question. Set? I anticipated that question. Had, had they asked for an injunction? To stop that action, yeah, it would be in the But they didn't ask they for didn't. an injunction. No. Can they still? No. Well, they, they might in their next action. So look for something next week. You know, they filed 60-day notice on August 20th, so that's coming right up next week. So, but what did the law professors say? So these these probably withstand court challenge. They are, in my view, very minor changes. But it, it's all the administration could do with all that rigmarole they've been trying to do since 1988 to change the law. They've been unable to. Congress has been unable to come to an agreement on what to do about this. Nancy. Given the pace of government responsiveness these days, how um, how optimistic are you about their ability? To pace with the degradation of the environment. We're seeing, you know, massive wildfires or huge extremes of weather with the, the storms uh, that we've had um, injuring the habitat for some of these threatened or endangered animals or species and potentially creating new threatened or endangered species because of that degradation. So what what's the role of government responsiveness in trying to keep up with that? Uh, even though they can't seem to get through a work day. Well, <laughs> that, that, that's a tough question, and you know I don't have an answer for that. But this, this is this is more than a governmental problem. This is a problem that all of us face. Do we have a moral responsibility to these other species? And that's why I wanted to put that at the end. Some people have a very strong feeling that yes, we do. Others, and I may be in this category. I'm not sure. I don't think the world would be worse off if the Snake River distinct population segment of sockeye salmon were to go away. They're just about to. I mean, they've been hanging on Lonesome Larry back in the early 1980s. With one sockeye salmon came back to Redfish Lake. Now 15 have come back, and this is after spending millions and millions of dollars. They just opened, three years ago, they opened a $14 million hatchery try to deal with this problem. They, they're sending 20,000 little fish out to the ocean and they're getting back. Uh, last year and the year before, a couple of hundred came by and were wrapped in. 
this year 81, and you know, a bunch of those get, get uh, eaten before they get to Red Fish Lake, or something happens to them before they get to Red Fish Lake. So, look at the range of sockeye salmon worldwide. Remember, we're doing the sockeye salmon is not going to go extinct if the distinct population segment in Red Fish Lake disappears.